Today, we continue our series on the visions of Zechariah, the book of Zechariah, the second to the last book of the Old Testament, easier to find that way. And uh, we're on the third vision, which is in Zechariah chapter 2. Our subject is the future of Jerusalem. I've been to a lot of places and seen things I never expected. For instance, um, I've been in India looking off at a distance at the Taj Mahal, then closing in on it, looking up close at the great building, and then touring inside. I've stood in the courtyard looking up at the palace of uh, Ceausescu, the Romanian dictator. This lavish palace he bought, brought for himself, and, and where he stood on the balcony addressing the throngs of thousands of people in that courtyard. And that last time he did it, the people shouted him down, and his career was about over. I've been for breakfast in London, and breakfast again in Switzerland. I've uh, visited the De Gaulle Airport, which to me seems in, in so much need of repair. I've slept at the Frankfurt Airport. I was there just after the new Turkish airport was open, so bright and so modern. I've been at the Milan airport, uh, so impressive that it's an, such an international airport. I spent a week in Sao Paulo, Brazil, ministering there. I've seen things I never expected to have seen, but I've never been to the most historic, most important place in the world. I've never visited the city of Jerusalem. Some folks standing there say that it seems like all history is passing before them. Oh, if they know the future of Jerusalem in the Bible, they would know some great things are maybe about to happen. Yet Jerusalem is a troubled city. In 586 B.C., it was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, and uh, he slaughtered the people, broke down the temple, devastated the temple and its walls, and uh, carried the rest of the people off into captivity 70 years in Babylon. In 70 AD, Titus and the Roman army came to the rebuilt city of Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, ruined the city's walls, and slaughtered the people, and scattered the people remaining throughout the centuries, for 19 centuries throughout the world. And yet, in 1948, Israel became a nation again. And in 1963, after a very brief war, Israel captured the city of Jerusalem. And they still don't really have full control. Half the city is Arab-occupied. The Dome of the Rock in the Mosque, Oscar, uh, prohibits Israeli control and keeps the temple away from Temple Mount. Folks who've loved Jerusalem have loved it across the centuries. During that Babylonian captivity, Psalm 137 writes this way about Jerusalem. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. Matter of fact, while Zechariah is giving these visions that have been given to him and sharing them with us, while that is going on, only 50,000 people have returned from the Babylonian captivity, a small remnant. And uh, Nehemiah Here's how the city is still in ruins, its temple, its walls. He is so brokenhearted about it. Nehemiah shares in chapter 1, I sat down and wept and mourned many days. So while Nehemiah is praying, getting ready to come and supervise the rebuilding of the city, its walls and its temple, God is giving Zechariah these visions to encourage the people. And it's giving them to the centuries, to you and to me. If 
for your encouragement and for mine. The vision begins in Zechariah 2, chapter, chapter 2, verse 1, as the prophet is uh, regathering himself from the first two visions, clearing his mind, and he looks up again, and God is ready to give him a third vision. Then I raised my eyes and looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. Who is this man with a measuring line? A lot of prophetic scholars think it's, a, again, a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus. Remember in chapter 1, the first vision, it's the rider on the red horse identified as the angel of the Lord. And that's the pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. And there's good reason to believe this man with a measuring line is, again, our Lord, preparing for his coming to be Savior of the world by appearing as a man in the Old Testament. And he's coming with authority. He's coming to bless Jerusalem. And that's what Zechariah wants to know about. Zechariah is not asleep. He's active in his visions. And he addresses the man with a measuring line. So I said, where are you going? And he said to me, to measure Jerusalem, to see what is its width and what is its length. The man with the measuring line is preparing to greatly bless Jerusalem. He's taking control. When we first moved to our area, we had next-door neighbors who were nice people, just uh, not the brightest, and sometimes hard to reason with. When our children were small, playing in the backyard, he would occasionally go out in the neighboring yard right next to them, only a fence between them, and he'd shoot to scare away birds. And I'd say to Mrs. to Leonard, uh, Leonard, please don't shoot your gun when my children are in the backyard. Oh, his wife reassured me. Don't worry, he couldn't hit the broad side of a barn. <laughs> well, it didn't really comfort me that he wasn't a very good shot. Uh, but the time, we always brought our children in whenever that happened of his shooting. But the, the time came when he put up nice bushes as a kind of demarcation line between his land and ours in the front yard. They were pretty bushes, you know, they'd put on these yellow flowers, and they'd become so expansive. The problem was, the three bushes he put towards the near, the near the road, when we would try to back out our car into the busy street, we couldn't see around the bushes to see if cars were coming. It was dangerous. Once my youngest son driving out there, uh, tried so hard to look around the bushes that uh, he forgot to look back a second time to see if cars were coming the other way. And he pulled out right in front of a car coming the other direction. Fortunately, there was no accident. I said, Leonard, please at least trim those bushes so we can see if cars are coming. But there were his bushes and he didn't see any need. Around that time, can't remember the reason. We had to have our land surveyed for something we wanted to do on our property. And uh, to my surprise, when the surveyors put up the flags, those three troubling bushes Leonard had planted on our property. They were our bushes. <laughs> I said to Leonard, Leonard, you see where those survey flags are? See where your three bushes are? That's our land. That's my property. And Leonard, those bushes are coming down. And they did. He didn't object. What could he say? And that was kind of taking control of a problem. Jerusalem has been devastated. The man with a measuring line is taking control. And he is measuring and surveying the city of Jerusalem for future blessing. Now, the interpreting angel who helps Zechariah with all these visions goes out to meet this man to talk with him further. But the man sends an, another angel to intercept the interpreting angel with this command. And there was the angel who talked with me going out, says Zechariah in verse 3 of chapter 2. Another angel was coming out to meet him. And this other angel gives this command to Zechariah's interpreting angel. And he says, 
Run, speak to the young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited with towns without walls because of the multitude of the livestock in it. Now, he's telling Zechariah a couple of things. Before we note what he's telling him, I want you to notice two things about this command from the intercepting angel. He tells the interpreting angel to run back to Zechariah. You run when you got really good news. Remember when Peter and John heard that Jesus had risen from the dead? Well, they ran to the tomb and saw that it was empty. And as run, speak to this young man. That's how we know Zechariah was a very young prophet. In fact, uh, that same word young is the word that Saul used when David, as a young man, wanted to take on the giant Goliath. And Saul said, well, you're just a youth. How could you take him out? Well, Zechariah was probably still a teenager, probably about the age of uh, Kenneth. And he's given this message. Run, speak to the young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls because of the multitude of men and livestock in it. The city is going to be so prosperous that walls will not be able to contain all the people. Only 50,000 there had returned. But it's going to, many more are going to come. Well, that's the near view. But there's a far view. This prophecy is reaching across the centuries. We know that because of the fifth verse. And, and, and where God says it not only will be prosperous, but it will be a protected city. Verse 5, For I, says the Lord, will be a wall of fire around her, and I will be the glory in her midst. You see, all these prophecies of Zechariah have a near view to encourage the people who have come back to the land to rebuild its walls and its temple. They've gotten discouraged. And uh, it has a far view of speaking the, of the future prosperity of Jerusalem at the end of time as we know it. For years I've puzzled over Ezekiel 38 and 39. I'm aware that Ezekiel 36 and 37 talks about the people of Israel, the Jewish people, returning from dispersion to the land of Israel. And that happened, and they became a nation in 1948. And they would return, Ezekiel 36 and 37 says, in unbelief, kind of like dry bones. Can these bones live? But Ezekiel, that's 96 and 97, but Ezekiel 98 and Ezekiel, excuse me, that's chapters 36 and 37 is they're coming back. Ezekiel 38 and 39 talks about the invasion of Gog and Magog. Now, almost all scholars see this as a territory of Russia for many reasons in that chapter. Uh, but there are Islamic nations who join Russia. For instance, Persia is named, which is modern Iran, Libya. Sudan, most are in agreement. Turkey's involved. And other nations in an end-time invasion of Israel. When I was at seminary, they proposed that this Latter-day invasion would be in the tribulation period after Antichrist makes a peace covenant with the Jewish people. And the seven-year tribulation period begins. But, uh, as I, as I look at this passage, it says the very thing that Zechariah is saying here. Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls, and uh, it will be a peaceful people. And uh, so peaceful that they let all their defenses down and no walls. And I'm saying to myself, even if Antichrist makes a peace covenant, if Russia is still menacing, if Arab nations are still threatening, how could Israel let down all their defenses? Another thing troubles me in that Ezekiel 38 passage, and that is the invasion is on horseback. And I'm asking myself, in the tribulation period, near the end time, 
why would Russia and the other nations give up their rockets and their fighter planes and their tanks just to ride in on horses? In fact, I lay awake at night trying to figure this out some time ago. I think I know the answer now. Ezekiel 38 and 39 is a double fulfillment. That is, part of it is fulfilled in the invasion in the latter days, and the other part of it is fulfilled at the end of the kingdom of Christ. Now let me give you examples of partial or double fulfillments. In Acts 2, the Holy Spirit comes and Peter explains what is happening. He says, this is what Joel prophesied. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. The Holy Spirit has come. And then, Joel, and then Peter adds on, And the sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into the blood, before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. Well, the sun hadn't turned into darkness. The moon hadn't turned into blood. That's at the second advent of Christ to the earth. So you see, Acts 2 is a partial fulfillment of a Joel prophecy that has double fulfillment. Isaiah chapter 9 talks about a child who is born, a son who is given, and the government shall be on his shoulder. First time he comes as a child, as a son given. But the second time Jesus comes, he comes to rule, and all the rest of the verse and the next verse is about his reign as king. So also, in all the prophecies of Zechari of these visions of Zechariah, all eight of them, there's a near fulfillment for Zechariah's day, but there is the ultimate fulfillment in the kingdom. And that's here. There would be prosperity and there'd be protection. For the Jerusalem will be without walls during the kingdom of Christ. For I, says the Lord, will be a wall of fire all around her, and I will be her glory in the midst. Near view and far view. Now, I want to give a number of applications here, because that's where Zechariah turns from the vision to give application after application. For instance, uh, in, in uh, Zechariah verse 5, it is, I believe, we read this exhortation. Excuse me, this is in verse 7. Up, up, flee from the land of the north, says the Lord. For I have spread you uh, abroad like the four winds of heaven, says the Lord. That's verse 6. And then verse 7 follows. Up, Zion, escape you who dwell with the daughter of Babylon. You see what he's saying here? He's saying, just the remnant has come back to Jerusalem and Israel. And most of the other people, after seven years, gotten comfortable in Babylon. Flee from the land of Babylon. Come back to the promised land of blessing. Don't stay in the land that's under the judgment of God. That's the near view. The rest of the people needed to come back. And Jerusalem would prosper and grow. That's the near view. But the far view has its application to the end times and to our day. For remember what Revelation is 17 and 18 say? It talks about Babylon and how we are need to get out of Babylon. In the end time in the tribulation period, Revelation 17 talks about mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots. In Revelation 17, Babylon represents false religion that starts with the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11, and filters through the Old Testament, and goes all the way to the end time. Babylon is false religion gathered together in the last days. It's a mixture of religion, probably, that pretends to be faithful to God. But God calls it in Revelation 17, the great heart. And God's people are to be true to Christ. They're not to embrace false religion. They're not to be so open-minded that they give up truth. We're to stand for the truth of the gospel of Christ. 
in chapter 18. Babylon is not false religion that in chapter 17 is destroyed by Antichrist as he sets himself up as God. But in chapter 18, Babylon is economic and political Babylon. It's this world system of finance and rule. And the command is to leave this Babylon too. And, and we read in, in Revelation chapter 18, this people, this uh, word, come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins. So just as in Zechariah's day, they were to flee from the land of Babylon, we're to come out from this economical, economic and political system that is this world system under the control of the devil. We're to leave false religion. We're to not love the political and economic system. Remember, John says, Love not the world, nor the things in the world, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away in the lust thereof, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. I think of another passage that reminds me of this Zechariah passage where God once again says, come out. For instance, uh, God says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 16 and 17, verses that are similar to God saying, I'll be in you and with you, and I'll be in your midst. And he's talking about how the Holy Spirit dwells in you. And once again, we're called to come out. Listen to how Paul says it in 2 Corinthians 6, 16 and 17. For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said. I will dwell in them and will walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you and I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Yes, one of the applications is where to come out of Babylon. <laughs> they were to come out, literally, of the Babylon of their day. We're to come out of this Babylonian world system in our day and in the day of the end time. Applications continue. For the next verse says, For thus says the Lord of hosts, He has sent me for his glory to the nations that plunder you. That's first part of verse 8. Some of the translation says, He has sent me after glory. I like the Holman Bible, that which was given to me. It's a, a study Bible. Translated, He has sent me for His glory to the nations which plunder you. Because I think that's the meaning, however it's translated. You see, if Jerusalem is in ruins, the temple destroyed, and the people distributed to Babylon or to the, to the ends of the earth. God seems to be dishonored. He made great promises to Jerusalem and to the people of Israel, his chosen people. And he's dishonored when his people have sinned and have lost the blessing in Jerusalem and in Israel. So when God restores prosperity to Jerusalem, it is glorifying to God. And so he has sent me for his glory to the nations which plunder you. And then the explanation further goes in verse 8. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. You see, God is glorified when his chosen people so precious to him are blessed. They are the apple of his eye. What, what does that mean? That's the pupil of his eye. And the most vulnerable, the most valuable part of your body is the pupil of your eye. That's your vision. That's what you try to protect first if something's coming at your head. Oh, you have tears that wash your eyes to keep them clean. Eyelids that blink to keep dust from coming in or dirt. 
You have eyebrows that are like awnings over your eyes and bones around your eyes to protect you. The pupil of your eye is so valuable to you. And God says, my chosen people are valuable to me. By the way, you're chosen too. New Testament says that. And uh, God identifies with you as his people. When Paul, Saul of Tarsus was perse persecuting Christians, Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? God takes it personal when his people are harmed. In the tribulation period when people help the Jewish people, on Judgment Day, God will say, this was a sign you really knew me. And as much as you did this unto this my people, you've done it unto me. I remember helping a lady who was in need, a, a Christian lady, giving her aid when she's a, fearful she was going to lose her apartment. And that was a blessing to me. And she's the one that gave me that Holman Bible, by the way, uh, that I like so well. But... Uh, I couldn't help thinking when I was doing that for her, I was doing it for God. When you do th good things for people in need, especially God's people, Jesus says, you're doing it for me. And so the applications continue. And there's a great reversal coming up in verses 9, 10, and 11. We read there, for surely I will shake my hand against them, and they shall become spoiled for their servants. Then you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. A great reversal. The people who had made God's people their servants. God says, I will shake my hand against them, and they shall become spoiled for the people they had made their servants. A great reversal when God greatly blesses his chosen people and reverses the circumstances completely. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. By the way, watch that in this passage, and you'll notice something. Jesus keeps saying that the Lord has sent me. And sometimes he's saying, identify himself as the Lord. And sometimes he says, the Lord has sent me. Notice that in verses 10 and 11. It only makes sense that the Lord could send the Lord if God is a triune being and God is sending his Son. The Bible is very uh, good at giving you so many hints about God. Now, we read not only of world uh, a wide blessing coming now that the chosen people uh, are blessed of God in the kingdom, in the far view. But we read in verse 11, Many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and they shall become my people, and I will dwell in your midst. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. There it is again. Jesus says, I'm coming. And I'm doing this, and then you know the Lord has sent me. And when that day comes of God's final blessing for Jerusalem, when Jerusalem becomes the capital city of the world during the reign of Christ, we read in verse 11, Many na nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, as I mentioned. And then in the following verse, verse 12, and the Lord will take possession of Judah as his inheritance in the Holy Land and will again choose Jerusalem. The Holy Land. That's the only time in the Bible where Israel is called the Holy Land. See, it's not really holy now. It won't be holy until Jesus is there and he reigns in the midst and the Jewish people are brought into fellowship with him. And worldwide salvation comes to the nations, and the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Then Israel will be the Holy Land, and Jesus will be there. 
and the land will be greatly blessed. Just a note again, today God dwells in your midst because you have the Holy Spirit from the moment you trusted Christ as your Savior. And God is so very much with you and near you. Now, it's fitting that the last verse of this vision closes this way. This is verse 13, I believe it is. Be silent, all flesh, before the Lord, for he is aroused from his holy habitation. You mean God's waking up? You mean God's been sleeping? The Bible says God can't sleep or slumber. But it seems like God's been asleep. He hasn't. It's just a matter of his timing. But to, to help us out who think that God's doing nothing, he wants us to know that in his timing at the right moment, God's going to rise up, judge the nations, bless Jerusalem with the coming of Christ, and he sets up his kingdom. And all the world will be blessed, and Israel will be, Jerusalem will be the capital city of the world. By the way, did you realize that Jerusalem will be the capital city of eternity too? Jesus has gone to make a place we think of as many mansions. That's the new Jerusalem. Revelation 21 says it comes down in the eternal state over the renovated new heaven and new earth, settles on the earth, and its gates are always open. It's our eternal home, this expansive, glorious city of Jerusalem, that uh, from there Christ rules the world and with the gates always open and angels at the gates greeting us. We can go in and out and enjoy the earth and, and enjoy all of God's creation with a new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. There's a great future for Jerusalem. We're told earlier in this passage, verse 10, Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion. Behold, I am coming and well will dwell in your midst, says the Lord. We have reason to sing and rejoice over the future of Jerusalem, to sing and rejoice over our future who know the Lord Jesus. If you don't know him, this is a great time to trust Christ as your personal Savior who died for you and rose again. Trust in his death and resurrection for atonement for your sins. Trust in the Savior of the world to save you and be so blessed for time and for eternity. Well, we may be wondering, how is God ever going to really make Israel the Holy Land? The answer is in the next vision. Vision chapter 4 in Zechariah 3. It's an amazing, wonderful prophecy that speaks to the centuries. Gives a beautiful picture of the gospel. And a beautiful picture of how God is going to make Israel the Holy Land. That's next for our next study.